I'm Letitia Grenier, the lead scientist for an effort to solve a problem that affects all of us in the Bay Area, but that you may not be aware of. How can we retain the wetlands that protect our shoreline but are threatened by climate change? Before we get started, I'll explain what baylands means. Baylands are the wetlands along the shore of the bay, or the areas between high and low tide elevations. This is the ecosystem you want to have to protect from future storms and sea level rise. Most of the California coast either never had baylands or has already lost them. But in the Bay Area, we're really lucky. We have a lot of baylands doing a ton of work for us. And we could have even more, but climate change is threatening to wipe out this valuable ecosystem. This talk is about a big effort to figure out how we can restore our baylands and keep them around, protecting our shoreline for the next century. As citizens of the Bay Area, we all know that we are facing critical decisions as climate change begins to ramp up its impact. One of the things we have to decide is if we want to invest in maintaining critical natural infrastructure that protects our shoreline. What is critical natural infrastructure? The kind I'm here to talk about is called tidal marshes. These are the marshes at the edge of the Bay. Tidal marshes matter because they do a lot of work for us. They help clean the water and recycle waste, they provide flood protection, in particular, they knock down waves during storms and high tides. They are both the nursery grounds and food supply for our native fish and wildlife. Many endangered species live only in the tidal marshes of San Francisco Bay and nowhere else on Earth. We like our baylands for recreation. They're beautiful. They bring the natural world to our doorstep. Around 1800, the bay had nearly 200,000 acres of tidal marsh. By 1998, only about 15% of it was left. The rest had been levied and used for salt production, agriculture, and urban development. In 1999, a large group of scientists and government officials got together to figure out how to make the bay healthier, and they calculated that we needed to restore a goal of 100,000 acres of tidal marsh to achieve a healthy bay shore. That science mandate sparked rapid restoration of tidal marsh by 2009, and acquisition of many more baylands to restore in the future. The bay shore has many other habitats in it besides tidal marsh, and plans for restoring these habitats, like mud flat and ponds managed for waterfowl, moved forward quickly as well. So if we look at the amount of tidal marsh in the bay over time, you'll see that we started with 40,000 acres in 1998 and restored 6,000 acres over the next decade by 2009. That is actually a big acceleration in the pace of restoration but the real gains were made in buying and permitting another 26,000 acres of for future tidal marsh restoration to bring the goal to 72,000 acres, or nearly three quarters of the 100,000 acre goal. All this restoration would have gone on to achieve the goal, no doubt, except for climate change and sea level rise. Tidal marshes have to build up rapidly to stay above water as sea level rises. And we know that sea level is going to increase very quickly starting in a few decades as global ice reserves melt. You can see how the curve starts going faster around 2050. That would be okay for marshes if they had enough sediment or earth to help them build up. Unfortunately, they don't. The sediment available in the bay decreased abruptly around 1998 and is now the lowest it has been for the past 150 years. We can calculate how this combination of high sea level rise and low sediment supply is going to affect our marshes, projecting what will happen between now and 2100. You can see how the green bar shrinks going from left to right. That's how our marshes will go away when they can't keep up with sea level rise. So that's a problem if you want to retain the clean water, flood protection, wildlife, and other great services that our baylands provide. But here's the interesting thing. There's a lot we can do about it. We can shift ourselves to a high sediment supply scenario. An amazing thing happens. Our marshes survive over time. We have a lot of marsh left in 2100. This is a basic management knob that we can turn and need to turn if we want to retain these ecosystems that protect our shorelines and the people behind them. So now you understand why we did this report. We call it the Baylands and Climate Change, What We Can Do, because there's a lot we can do. Over 200 scientists and government officials collaborated to come up with a science-based vision of how to keep healthy baylands that will benefit people and wildlife for the next century, overcoming the challenges of climate change and sediment supply. The project was convened by the California Coastal Conservancy and represents the participation of many federal, state, and local organizations that work on keeping the bay healthy. 
This report was written by scientists and reviewed by an independent science panel, so we knew the science was state-of-the-art. The process was guided by a committee of the agencies that would need to use the information produced and think about how this latest science might affect their policies. You can see that there were 21 regulatory, restoration, and science organizations involved in making sure the science produced what was relevant to the critical management issues at hand. So, what are the things we can do? The first step is to restore complete systems. Well, what does that mean? It means not limiting our thinking to just restoring habitats. Let's restore the processes that create and maintain the habitats over time into the future. To restore tidal marsh, we must restore the high marsh, the marsh plain in the middle, and the low marsh, and also the lower elevation habitats that protect the marsh. That includes the mud flats, the oyster reefs, and eelgrass. Sometimes there's a beach on the bay side of the marsh. All of those things physically protect the marsh, and then the marsh protects whatever's behind it. What's also important is the area between the marsh and the uplands. That's where all the creatures have to go when the tide gets high or if there's a storm. And what's behind that transition zone? In the Bay Area, there's a lot of valuable assets being protected by this ecosystem. It might be the Oracle buildings, your sewage treatment plant, an airport, the freeway you take to work, or your house. Tidal marshes and other baylands protect our communities and the infrastructure that's right behind the marshes. To restore complete systems, we need to restore the processes that maintain the habitats over time. Baylands are formed and maintained by processes coming from the land and coming from the Bay. From the land side, we need the hill slope and stream processes that bring fresh water and sediment into the baylands. In this artist's rendering, the stream in the lower right enters the baylands, deposits sediment, creating a wetland complex and a riparian corridor going up to the stream. These are really important habitats for wildlife. We'll need a lot of new thinking coming from the watershed side to restore these processes. How do we restore natural stream flows and beneficial floods? How do we let groundwater recharge happen in floodplains? These things that are good for water supply and water quality will also restore the system that maintains the baylands. From the bay side, we need to think about the tidal forces that make the baylands. The tides bring sediment and water into the marshes, building them up. What we shouldn't do is take a step backwards and start building tidal barriers that prevent those forces from nourishing the baylands. Here's an example of a real project that the San Francisco Estuary Institute is doing for the East Bay Discharges Authority. They know that sea level rise will inundate their wastewater infrastructure, so they're looking for innovative solutions. One thing that could be done differently is how they dispose of the effluent from the plant. Historically, large streams in this area entered into the back of large marshes, nourishing the marshes with fresh water and sediment so that they grew rapidly. Nowadays, most of our streams are trapped between levees as they pass through the baylands. That water goes straight out into the bay. What can we do in the future? We can use the past for inspiration about what would be most valuable and functional. We could actually put clean wastewater effluent back into creeks and let them deliver sediment and fresh water into the baylands. No levees this time, just restoring those natural processes right back into the baylands. So natural processes are really important but we can also use artificial processes to make sure that we use all the available sediment. We really need to reuse all the clean sediment that's dredged from shipping channels and flood control channels. We've been working on that for decades, but we're currently reusing only about a third of what is dredged. We will also need excavated sediment from the watershed. Wherever we can get it, clean and appropriate sediment can be reused to restore and maintain our baylands. What's another thing we can do? We need to restore marshes soon before the sea level rise acceleration gets going really fast. Well-established wetlands can combat sea level rise better than very young marshes and could persist for several decades longer. As we restore, we must prioritize those places that have a good sediment supply where the restored marshes are likely to survive for the long term. Restoring complete systems and restoring soon will help the baylands grow vertically to keep up with sea level. But there's another thing we can do. We can also let them move sideways. Tidal marshes will naturally move inland or migrate over time as sea level rises. If we plan ahead, we can let them do that by making space. It may even be cheaper than trying to help them accrete vertically in some places. Here's a section of the shore with tidal marsh on the right and a stream coming in from the left. 
Now the white line is the current boundary of the balins. We can predict pretty accurately where those balins are going to want to migrate in 20, 50, or 100 years as sea level rises. We can identify this area between the two white lines and decide what's best to do with this migration space. There's many things you can do. Acquire and conserve if it's undeveloped. In heavily urbanized areas, you may want to construct a low slope or horizontal levee to create a space for the marsh to migrate. Or in the long term, you could consider planned retreat. These are tough policy decisions, but the discussions are overdue. So what can we do? We can restore complete systems, including the processes that create and maintain marshes. We can restore soon in areas where the balins are likely to persist. And we can plan for the balins to migrate. So how does this really work? You can put these ideas into a management framework with thresholds, decision points, and lead times to plan for effective solutions. This approach can help local communities integrate these complex ideas together with other social and economic needs. How are we going to come up with the local visions and plans? One idea stemming from the report is to define practical science-based shoreline units. These units would be defined by factors like wave action, sediment supply, the amount of balins, and the amount of development. These factors define the sea level rise adaptation strategies that are appropriate in a particular area. Then within those boundaries, stakeholders would come together to create a long-term vision of resilience for sea level rise. Community leaders and experts in ecosystem science and economics would evaluate the different ideas, constraints, and options. It would be a challenging conversation, but the idea would be to agree on a vision for the shore that maximizes the benefits. So in conclusion, we have tough choices to make. We know that we're going to need some levees and seawalls, and we also want to have some beautiful balins protecting our shore. Let's work together to use balins as a natural infrastructure for climate adaptation.